Hey, welcome to Bifocal. Uh, today's show, we have a returning guest back. We have Lauren Zach, Director of Account Development for Concept, and uh, she's going to come back in and talk about some changes that she's experiencing in the market as it relates to sales and marketing and account development. So stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. Today's show, uh, I think, is going to be kind of interesting because it's going to be uh, pretty current. It's going to be um, talking about a, a subject matter that's that's dear to all of us right now, and that's sales. And uh, we have Lauren Zach, Director of Account Development for Concept here. And uh, Lauren's going to kind of share some firsthand experience, what she's seeing in the market relative to uh, working uh, accounts, managing accounts, talking sales and marketing with companies, and kind of firsthand what she's experiencing. So Lauren, welcome to Bifocal. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's good, yeah. To, good to see you. Nice to see you too. Nice to be in person with you too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've talked to you a couple times uh, over Teams mm -hmm. or some video conference, and, mm -hmm. uh, but good to see you. Yes, likewise. I think the last time you and I were in here in the studio, you had mentioned that you were traveling every week of the year mm -hmm. and you were out in front of yes. customers, something that seems very foreign now. Yes. Um, pretty much for the last two, almost three years, I typically would travel about once a week, sometimes twice a week uh, to see prospects and customers, go to industry events trade shows, et cetera. And so um, life has drastically changed yeah. um, since uh, I returned back from a trade show in, in March of this year, I haven't left. So you have done no customer business travel since then? That's correct, yes. I have, wow. not, uh, have not physically seen So anyone. is your life like a 180 different, <laughs> different now? Yeah, uh, it definitely is. I mean, I had, you know, kind of, put my own schedule uh, personally, I think on hold and, you know, didn't really um, have too many outside of work hobbies when you're on the road like that. You're yeah, getting, you're working you're in getting airports home. and yeah. hotel rooms and now you're working in your house. Yeah. I used to get home at, you know, one, two o'clock in the morning and leave my suitcase at the door, go to sleep, wake up and sometimes have to repack. So life is definitely different. My, uh, my garden is flourishing this summer because yeah. <laughs> I've had a lot more time to, uh, to spend, uh, at home. So it's been, you know, a blessing in, in some ways, but it's certainly, um, frustrating and, um, just a little lackluster when you get really, you know, yeah used to that travel lifestyle. How, how much of a change, how big was the transition at first for you? Like, was it tough? Like, how, okay, what am I going to do here? How am I going to get in front of customers? How am I going to keep some relationships going? Walk me through a little bit about how that transition was for you. Sure. Yeah. Well, the transition for me, I think is something that I actually haven't really processed until later on after the pandemic hit. So the first couple months of businesses shutting down, you know, the virus spreading, a lot of fear and, and lack of knowledge as to what was to come. I was, you know, there with my customers in the trenches, there with my team in the trenches, trying to get in front of people, you know, retune messaging, figure out different channels of getting in touch with their customers and their prospects. And I think, you know, for a lot of companies, concept included, and all the companies that we support, there was a bit of defense that was going on and they had to defense kind of lock in down what, in like what defending from what like what do you think what were you yeah defending from you know market challenges and economic volatility i think there's you know there's there was a lot of uncertainty and there still is but you know, especially march and april we had no idea uh what you know life as we know it would turn into Did you, were you kind of uh, feeling from your customers it was going into protection mode? Yes. Everybody was kind of withdrawing a little bit? Yes, I'd say a, a good portion, probably about 75% of customers were just trying to stay stay the course, be consistent in the way that they service their customers, be consistent in their messaging, getting, you know, um, getting the message out there that they're open for business and that they're doing everything that they can to, you know, be safe and to keep 
you know, their business running, et cetera. And so there's a lot of, you know, similarities between customers, you know, regardless of industry and regardless of size. But I think size of organization uh, many times dictated um, looking at spend and, and future investment during this time. And I'm sure concept going through the same kind of stuff at the same time. Sure. So you can relate, right? Absolutely. Everyone is. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a personal piece to it. There's a, you know, a business piece for, for the company that you work for. And then when you're an agency partner, like concept, you know, I'm, I'm in, you know, hundred organizations, uh, sales teams and marketing teams, obviously not all at once. I wouldn't have enough time in the day, but, um, you feel their pain, your own pain you're in the trenches and then your personal them. pain. Yeah. 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 So my, um, you know, my, I guess, reconciliation with what happened in the first few months of COVID hitting has really come about probably in the last month or so where my life settled down a little bit more in the sense of um, not as many fires to put out, um, more forward thinking conversations than, you know, reactive conversations. And so uh, I, I did a lot of reflecting and I think, um, just mentally, I'm in a different place than I was, yeah. you know, come, the, the, come June. The, the forward thinking um, perspective. Are you seeing more of that now from companies? I am. Yeah. I, I think it's a grab bag really still out there. And, and and I think it will continue to be a grab bag as we really don't know what's to come, um, again, from an economic perspective, health perspective, and really also just in terms of employment, you know, how employers are keeping their people or potentially automating some roles or downsizing because they've learned they can be a lot leaner than they thought they could. So, you know, I think it's a grab bag. Some some even, you know, smaller organizations are willing to shell out, you know, money to invest in their future, invest in refilling their pipeline, invest in um, you know, bringing their brand and their company to the forefront when a lot of companies have sunk back. And, you know, it, it really could be either either scenario and it, it doesn't necessarily matter on size or industry. Um, but I would I would say that now I'm starting to feel a turn in terms of, you know, folks being a little bit more interested in, in a future. Do you feel like you're getting back to a normal, like your routine's getting more normal now, your conversations are getting more normal now? I, you know, I know this is going to sound silly, but I really didn't have a routine. <laughs> you uh, know, let me rephrase. When you're on the are road, you creating as much as I a was. routine now? Uh, yes and no. I, you know, some people do really well with routines. I do really well when I'm put in uncomfortable, high pressure situations. And so you like that's having been your a, back against the wall? Yeah, I do. You like that? I do. Well, professionally, I do. I, yeah. I feel I'm most challenged. I think I do my best work. I think I'm most creative that, uh, you know, that I am um, when I'm in a situation where I'm up against something that seems insurmountable or that I have an audience with, uh, you know, folks who have a, a whole lot more experience than I do. And I need to figure out how to discover what their needs and pains are and then, you know, cater and personalize our solutions to fit those pains. That's, that's what I really love to do is I love to learn about a company and their pains. And I don't pretend like I know everything because I don't know everything. Um, but I, you know, certainly know enough about sales and marketing and, and process and CRM to be able to come up with ideas. Are you on a the research type person? Do you like to, to research, to get ideas or solutions? Do you like to read in the market and trends? Are you that type of person or are you more of a hands-on? I'm living it. Yeah. I see it firsthand. Therefore, I don't need to read all about sure. it. I'm where, who are you? I would say I'm probably 75% hands-on, 25% research. There are so much great content out there. <clears throat> um, and, you know, we're involved in many industry groups where I kind of lead that relationship. And so there's education at your fingertips. That's, you know, obviously evolved tremendously during this pandemic. And, and so, you know, I can go online and watch a five minute video that gives me the same information that it would take for me to read a, you know, 
four or five page article. It's easier for me to digest. So I, I certainly do like to learn about trends, um, new products coming out, new softwares, new ideas. Um, but uh, I prefer to be in a hands-on learning environment. Yeah. yeah. So what are, are you seeing anything kind of consistent in the market from customers? Like, um, their thought process, their direction they're moving forward, or their philosophy. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing anything that's kind of like, wow, I'm starting to see some trends here? Yeah. I think the biggest thing that I'm seeing that's the, probably the most consistent, putting aside investment, putting inside marketing, sales spend, shiny new CRM, um, you know, plugins, shiny new video plugins. The, the thing that's most consistent is, you know, sales leaders, marketing leaders are taking a look at what they previously did. They had to figure out a way to streamline it, potentially reduce spend, reduce teams, you know, more um, put more of a focus and, and, and target um, certain industries or companies or messages. And so coming out of the pandemic, if that's what's happening right now, as we start to feel businesses loosen up a bit, I think you know most organizations that went through that um, pause, that kind of pullback are wondering and trying to figure out from a process perspective, where their gaps were and how do they fill those gaps? And then, you know, how do they redevelop their business in a way that fits the current climate? I've, I've had several shows talking to different sales and marketing uh, leaders, and there seems to be a little bit of a common thread. And I'm, I'm interested to hear your take on it because I'm thinking that's kind of what you're saying. Are you seeing or are you hearing uh, more with less? Yes. Type? That's that's a common thing now. Absolutely. You know, I think we're, we're just talking about this today, a colleague of mine. Um, there's a one to one approach in the way that people market and the way that people sell and build relationships. Right. So you and I are having a conversation in person today. It's personalized. <clears throat> clearly, it's natural. You know, I've learned things about you. You've learned things about me. It's a it's a real relationship. Then there's the other side of communication, which can be one to many. And so, you know, marketing is one to many when you're putting out email campaigns or ads or social media marketing. And I'm, I've seen a lot of organizations that when the, you know, the crisis hit, the pandemic hit, they cut down on that one to one because they were forced to. And they don't have the horsepower to only interact one to one. When you say they cut down, describe for me what did you see that you're saying they cut down? Like what? What did they do? In person visits, lunches, trade shows, presentations, uh, stopping in to see your customer when you happen to be in the area. Was there a lot of that relationship building? Were you seeing a building. lot of companies uh, downsizing sales reps? I would say I didn't see a huge amount of um, companies downsizing sales reps, but I did see them repurposing sales reps to focus in areas that weren't necessarily uh, a key responsibility of theirs, such as inside sales, such as operationally supporting the business. You know, they might be really just focused on selling a piece of equipment or selling their their service or solution offering normally. But I saw a lot of salespeople get pulled into, whether they liked it or not, an all hands on deck, you're wearing a million hats, you know, be grateful, I think, you know, that you have yeah. you have a job and that you've got customers that have needs and we have to do everything yeah. that we can. Well, the to reason I asked that question is, uh, as I share, I, you know, I talked to a lot of people. I've heard many times that the one area that most companies did not cut back on was their frontline salespeople. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what, what you're saying. Yes. But what I've also heard was when they brought those people back in the office a lot of them were like, well, okay, what, what, what do you do want I do? What, what do you want me to do now? This is not, it's kind of like I travel all the time. Now I'm home. What do you want me to do? Right? Yeah. And so I've heard a lot of that too. So what have you experienced with sales reps coming back in now working in the office? Yeah. Uh, it's, 
uh, you know, being a salesperson, depending on what you sell and how you sell, can be, you know, just have a really high level of expertise, right? Like you are going into, let's say, a facility and almost acting as an engineer to help your customer find the right piece of equipment or the right setup or the right application, or you're a transportation provider, but you don't just do one part of transportation. You look at their entire supply chain and that consultative piece when you're not in person tough. is tough. And so coming back, you know, a lot of, a lot of those individuals that would be in person like me having a consultative, you know, real um, brainstorming creative session with their customers, helping solve bigger business problems than buying a piece of equipment or, you know, buying a, an ad campaign as a shot in the arm type of thing. It, it, you know, they had to kind of fine tune other skill sets yeah. like prospecting, Feel handcuffed a little cost, bit. customer service, being able to manage their territory, reach out to as many customers they possibly could. So, you know, that's really where I'm going with that one to many type of ideas that I saw a lot of companies say, we can't do one to one physical in person. We don't have the horsepower to do one to one, even just calling and emailing. When you think about how many accounts a lot of salespeople are responsible for. And so a lot of organizations just shifted all their money to ads. They shifted all their money to email marketing. And they thought, you know what, this is the only way I'm going to have that reach today. But then forgot that when you only do top of funnel activities and you're only marketing one to many, there's a gap between a one to many message and actually selling your solution or your, your service or there's your still, product. There's still a need here in the middle funnel, middle of the funnel. There is. And the goal, you know, I think is, <laughs> is, and what more companies are realizing is that you can't do one or the other. You have to have both. And the, the mixture, let's say, um, that might be 50, 50 pre COVID might be 40, 60 might now be 10% one to one, 90% marketing. Yep. And and that's shifting every day. Yeah. And it depends on the industries that you support. Well, I'm so assuming it, right now that that's a struggle complex. for companies is trying to find that balance for them. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. And it's a struggle for companies that um, don't have the technology or don't have adoption to the process that they've put in place for their salespeople to even understand the impact. So I always, whenever I talk about um, investments. A lot of times people think I only am talking about investments that I sell like marketing services or CRM services or sales development calling services. But I want to remind the people that I'm working with that their salespeople are investments. Yeah. And so, you know, how are we maximizing what they, what they do on a daily basis and how do you prove it? Because in the past, they could say, oh, I went to go see this person, that person. We went out to lunch with this person. Well, now everything, you know, all that activity is missing. So what's filling it? Okay, here's a question. <clears throat> You're kind of that salesperson you just described. Mm -hmm. You're, you were... You're kind of a touchy-feely type person. You love relationships. You like being out in front of people, right? You like the one-to-one. -one. I do, yeah. But now you can't do it. So what have you, what have you personally done to try to modify that, to compensate for that? What mm -hmm. What's your day look like? Yeah, well, you know, in terms of one-to-one -one versus one-to-many, my position in concept is really focused on one-to-one. -one. And so the one-to-many approach is handled by our sales and marketing team. I'm not sending out email campaigns or marketing automation. Have I have a very targeted target audience. audience. Yeah. So my one-to-one -one connection in person died, <laughs> but I still have to find a way to have one-to-one -one connection. So, you know, I've been really relying on video. I think a lot of folks are really starting to um, utilize video as a way to break through the noise. And I'm guessing pretty soon that video is going to also become noise. Um, but I started working um, with a, um, a software that 
plugs into our marketing automation. Um, and I'm not using it with marketing automation, but it just happens to flow through our HubSpot. And I am sending personalized messages to uh, prospects and customers that instead of me writing, you know, a one or two paragraph email, I'm just talking to them, looking at my camera, oh, yeah. sitting in my make living sure I room. I understand this. You're sending a personalized video. Yes. Instead of sending an email. Yep. And I'm not doing it every time, but it definitely has helped cut through some of the noise. And is this mainly to people you know or they know you? Both. Okay. Both. Yeah. And, you know, of course, when you're in targeted sales, you're, you know, trying to utilize your network and referrals to even just warm up the conversation, not saying, okay, this person is an advocate yeah. and a, you know, a promoter of what I do, but they at least know me enough to say, Hey, have you met Lauren before? And then make that introduction a little bit more. So you're warm. looking for a way to be a little bit more creative, a little bit easier way to break the ice. Yeah. How's how's that working? How are people responding? To so that? far, pretty well. I mean, you know, of course, I have a a few that haven't responded. Um, you'll get that at sales anytime. Um, and you know, people are busy and challenged right now, and not every organization probably no organization's got it figured out where people aren't still running around like chickens with their heads cut off. Yeah. So I get that. Um, but overall, the response has been pretty good. Um, I actually had a, a prospect of, of mine that I've been working with over the, the last few months. I sent um, him a video and uh, he said, I watched your video. Congratulations. Your tactic worked. <laughs> Caught my <laughs> eye. <laughs> <laughs> Caught my eye. And yes, I do want to talk about X, Y, and Z. And so, you know, that was really nice to see. That was one of the first ones I sent yeah. out that I got that validation. And, you know, it's nerve wracking. I'm a people person. I've been, you know, um, asked to do speaking events. I've been in cam in front of cameras a million times more than I ever thought I would be in a sales marketing role. Um, you know, even just coming into concept but it's still nerve wracking to put yourself out there and to look into this lifeless computer in front of you and try to evoke Especially your when personality. when you're all by yourself in a room, all yeah. by yourself. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and um, my boyfriend does not work from home. He's out in the market in sales. And so I'm literally home alone all day. And the only interaction that I get is with the male, the male lady. <laughs> That's all the interaction that I have. And yeah. so I'm really relying on video um, to still be myself, still feel like myself. What's the percent of your calls are video versus just phone calls, conference calls? I'd say probably about 80% of my calls are video now. Really? Yes. Has, um, has that picked up as, as early as maybe 30 days ago, 60 days ago? Yeah, I'd probably say 60 days ago. Um, it's kind of becoming the norm. Yes, it's certainly grown. Uh, initially, w I was only doing video calls with our internal team. And that helps still, you know, inspire our, our you know, sense of culture and camaraderie. Um, and, you know, the work from home, WFH environment, you got to see everybody's house and how their setup was evolving as they realized it wasn't going to be just a couple days or a couple weeks. Yeah. I mean, right when we found out, I ran out to West Elm and bought a desk literally hours before they closed down for months. It was their last desk. <laughs> yeah, you probably weren't set up at home at all with your with your traveling. And I wasn't and I have a little Surface Pro so you know I can typically work on the go pretty well but I wanted to move my monitors home and have a little bit more of a stable environment but you know initially it was all internal and then I'd say probably about 60 maybe 75 days ago is when I really started to see customers and prospects doing it and what's shocking to me is that um, sales reps uh, for the most part, I don't want to stereotype that, but sales reps and mid-level management, for the most part, have not been embracing the video lifestyle as much as folks in leadership. And why do you think that? Is? Initially, I thought it would be the opposite, um, but I think it's because you know people in leadership are typically 
a leader because their personality and the way that they interact with someone is compelling. And they're not a leader because they happen to get this title and, and they dict- dictate everything by email and people just listen to so it they because they have see to. You. They wanna- yeah. The, the good leaders that I work with are, are people that will get in the weeds with you, that don't talk down to you, that are there fighting with, with you mm-hmm. and seeing the other person and seeing their emotion, I think is something that, you know, those leaders are, um, trying to continue, um, yeah. inside of their organizations. Interesting. Mm-hmm. How you mentioned a, a while ago, you started talking about, um, positioning and you talked a little bit about approach. Are you finding your approach different today than three months ago? Are you talking about different things or are you emphasizing maybe different things more today? Mm-hmm. And, and like what? Yeah. Um, I think three months ago, a lot of the discussions were leaning towards short term. What do we do? What campaign can I run? What uh, ad can I uh, put out there? What message can I put out there just to hold us over, to tide us over until this is all done? Because the pandemic has lasted longer than I think the everyday person expects expected it would people are now saying oh wow this is a whole shift in our reality so i can't look at my next year in quarters i can't look at my next five years in quarters i need to be looking at a year plan two years down the road what do we need to do infrastructure wise to to plan what do we need to do culturally to evolve and change and so i i'm having a lot more high level conversations than i did when we were in a state of disarray so it, it i guess by if i summarize what you're saying is are you seeing companies more strategic now yes a lot more strategic than they were before yes i am the reason i mention that is i i i hear a lot everyone's saying you know, the positive thing about COVID is it's forced us, this is paraphrase, it's forced us to do things that we probably should have been doing. Absolutely. It just sped it up a lot. Yes. Yeah. You agree with that? I, I do. Uh, for for our business uh, concept and also for our, for our customers and prospects business, yeah. it's, um, it's forced a lot of companies to... Um, understand redundancy that they have in their company, both positively and negatively. So if they have too much redundancy, maybe they had to lay off some people, maybe they had to find other areas or furlough people. And then on the contrary, if they're, you know, their people are putting out fires and and they're they're stretched really thin and there's a lack of redundancy, then we can certainly see things fall through the cracks, um, like retaining current customers, like uh, ensuring that you know they have a good understanding of their profit margin and what's going on there. Just over just general oversight. So I think there's um, there's you know an opportunity for companies right now to take a step back and say what are we doing well. Where can we improve? Let's let's really design our teams in a way that we can segment and assign those duties to you know retain our, their business, um, make sure that they're operationally efficient, and then try to find additional Are ways to grow. Are you seeing much restructuring, sales restructuring? Yeah, I have. Um, that being said, I don't know that it's incredibly different right now. But I think in the next three months, six months, a year is when it's going to shift. Right now, I think people are still in the discovery stage. What happened? What went wrong? Where's the gap? All of that. Now we're now we're going to take inventory of it and we're going to try to make sense of it. And then we're going to try to plan. But I don't think that they've actually, you know, done the the restructure with customers now. Yeah, I think they are, Um, you know. Again, I think they're more forward thinking. I think customers are more interested in technology than they've ever been. Um, and I think that um, customers are also looking at um, business continuity and really ensuring that what they've put into place isn't that shot in the arm type of 
of approach and that they have that more strategic plan. Why do you think that? Why do you think that's their approach and that's their thought process now? Well, I think a lot of uh, sales organizations, um, you know, sales leadership can can sometimes be a person that's just really good at selling that happened to be put in a managerial position or in a leadership position. And so they might be wonderful at helping a sales rep to go close, or they might really know the industry very well. Um, but in terms of structuring, managing, and, you know, essentially analyzing the team and the results, um, they don't have a lot of experience there. And so I think there's been a lack of uh, attention to overall process and then adoption to that process. And then again, that like return on investment of, of so those how salespeople. Companies, I, I, it's interesting when I, I do some of these shows because I, I'm hearing the same stuff kind of over and over. And I ask the same questions often, okay? <laughs> Just to kind of hear. And I've heard that often, okay? Here's a question though. You described a company that said, um, hey, the sales manager I had, he or she was very good in sales. So they were good at getting pulled in and, and helping close a deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's kind of what, what you were implying. But maybe they weren't as strong in process and direction and strategy. Yes. Okay. So today, though, the company's sitting back saying, I got to make sure process and strategy because I can't afford to be inefficient mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. How does a company, or are you seeing some of this? And if you're not, maybe you can give your opinion. How does a company get through that? If they got the yeah. wrong person in place and they can't wait six months, mm -hmm. we don't, we, none of us have six months to wait. We got to be there tomorrow. Sure. So how do they get through that? I think there's a variety of ways that they get through that scenario. Let me say that. That person might not be the wrong person. That person might not have direction from leadership higher than them. They might not have exercised that skill set in a while or ever. And so they need to go back and educate themselves and work with their, their colleagues to um, get up to speed and get up to speed fast. So there's a learning curve to you know, strategic approach and process um, and driving adoption. Um, and for many organizations, that takes years. Like you said, they don't have years. They don't have six months. They need it to happen now. So, you know, I, I don't see a lot of organizations letting go of people that are good at selling right now. Yeah. But I see them either, you know, challenging their leadership to, um, you know, basically hone in on some different skill sets um, and um, try to be more effective um, from a management perspective and maybe helping their team to be as successful as they are in sales so that they can give up some of that sales responsibility yeah. and then focus on the, the process side of things. The contrary to that is, you know, in, in fear of sounding like a, a pitch, outsourcing. There are plenty of consultants and partners that have that expertise. And so now's a great time for, for my business and, and for Concepts business because if they don't have that skill set, they don't have to go through the hiring process and the onboarding to get that person either up to speed on their industry or their company or their team. They can, you know, hire in and bring someone in and expedite that process yeah. um, <clears throat> through, a, through a third party vendor. Along those lines, I've been kind of here in a mixed bag. I've heard and, and seen some companies who have totally walked away from managing that internally now. Mm -hmm. They've totally outsourced that. And some of the reasons are we just don't want the employees anymore. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't want to have that headcount anymore in light of everything. I just don't want that. I'm outsourcing all of that. Mm -hmm. I've seen other companies say, you know what, we're bringing that back in right now because we think maybe we can do it cheaper, so we're going to try to do it internally. I'm actually seeing a little bit of shift on sure. both sides. Are you seeing any of that? Yes, I am. Um, you know, bringing things internal, I think any company that has had a strong sense of kind of boots on the ground, grow up in our organization, shies away from outsourcing. 
They think that they can do it better and for cheaper because the people, they know the people and they know the business. But, you know, there's a lot of skill sets that um, unless you're trained, unless you're constantly receiving education on what's new, what's more efficient, what's more effective, you can actually be wasting a lot of time and, and resources by having to double down on efforts of that person that you could do it cheaper with instead of prescribing the right solution and then the right team through an outsourced partner. So yeah, I've definitely seen both. You know, I think best case scenario is a combination. You have to have that vision from a company perspective, you know, having a, a partner come in and be consultative and, you know, pr- prescribe methodology Are and prescribe that. Are you being called to be more consultative now? Yes, I'd say. But I, I think, you know, I've been, I've was probably being called to be more, a little bit more consultative even before the, the pandemic. Um, I think the organizations are just interested today forward thinking ones at least in not outsourcing, but just gaining knowledge, yeah. perspective and expertise Lauren, tell elsewhere. tell me what you see. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, when you look at an agency partner versus one company, if someone grew up in that organization and now they're in sales leadership or they're in marketing leadership or even in an execution execution uh, role, they they only know that one business. And then learning about the market and learning about other businesses is something that they're going to have to do on their own time. Every, you know, every company says, oh, yeah, we give you, you know, the resources, the tools, the time. We tell you to go get education. We might even pay for it. But no one has the time. So working in an agency scenario, and one of the reasons why I love my job so much is that I get to be in a million companies at the same time. And they're at all different points in their life cycle. And some of them, I'm right there with them. I've never been in front of this challenge before. And others, I've seen it happen elsewhere and I can provide some perspective. And I might not have all the answers for them. Uh, Every company is unique. Uh, But you you can put them on the right path. But I can say, here's what I saw here. Let's avoid this pothole. Or this is a really great uh, you know, solution or really great process that took months and years to develop. And now I know that it's a best practice and I can bring that to you and bring you that insight. And, you know, I think as, as I'm, you know, starting to work more in the consulting space and even just, you know, opinion feedback space, not necessarily a hundred percent consultant, I feel like I'm more, um, unbiased than I've ever been. Yeah. Yeah. You're a, uh, you're a big CRM user. I am. Yes. Yeah. yeah some, I have to be. <laughs> some would consider you probably a, uh, an expert CRM user and, and a, a connoisseur of CRM. You've you spoken. Well, I'm sure that, yes, I'm sure that anyone that um, knows me on the line knows that I'm not a certified admin would probably cringe at you saying that. But what I, what I specialize is in is really actually CRM adoption. But it's even above CRM. It's, that, it's the idea of process adoption. Yeah. Yeah. What are you seeing in the market relative to CRM? Oh, it's booming. It is. It's booming. booming. Yeah. Yes. Why? Why do you think? Companies are going through that evolution and that transition where they need to be uh, more aware of what's happening inside of their mm. business and what's to come. And so that for that forecasting aspect of CRM has been missing. So many organizations, <clears throat> and I, I've said this time and time again, so it's it's becoming like a tagline. Um, and I have a conversation with my boss, Jeff, to thank for it. So many, co- so many organizations have looked at CRM as a way to gauge what happened. It's a like monitoring tool. Oh, yeah. we saw this happen, that happened. You sold Looking this, backwards. you sold that. Yeah. Looking in the rear view mirror. What CRM really should be doing is helping you to manage redevelop process, and then forecast. And I think companies now are saying, man, I know everywhere my guy went but or my lady went, but they're not selling anymore. Why? Well, maybe it wasn't the right company to target in the first place. 
let's take a step back and figure out what type of intelligence we could pump in through technology so that they don't spend their time and spin their wheels with a customer that's not actually good fit. Is there an urgency to get there, you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of organizations, especially in, especially in the um, industrial manufacturing space or industrial equipment space, are kicking themselves that they didn't do this sooner. And, you know, I, I could agree in, in some, you know, aspects, but I think a lot of companies just culturally weren't ready for it. And I'm a, I'm a big advocate for waiting until you are culturally ready or that you have the leadership and the appetite to make well, that change. You mentioned user adoption. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're not culturally ready, CRM doesn't work. It's not a plug and play and just go. No. Right? The culture has to be there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably another positive of the situation today is it's forcing people to get in and use it. And, you know, you can easily sit back and say, well, you should have done that three years ago. Sure. Well, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? Yeah. But that is probably a positive because I think everyone now is sitting back saying, geez, I really could use the benefits, mm -hmm. the functionality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the trick is, you know, with CRM is... It's a tool, right, that I, I said it monitors, it, it helps you build process, but it doesn't build process for you. And then it helps you forecast, it helps you look into the future. But I think what a lot of people realize is just because you put a CRM, or you don't realize is that just because you put a CRM into an organization, people all of a sudden aren't going to just perform better and be more accountable than they were in the past. Yeah. You just have eyes mm -hmm. on it. And so that's the cultural piece. Just because you put gas driving, in the car, it doesn't Yeah, go. it's driving that accountability. That's it. And setting clear expectations and working with your team to meet the expectations or understand, you know, what areas they need to work on. And so, you know, there's a, a lot of work that our CRM team is doing right now on um kind of sales accelerator tools where they're looking at, you know, um, the market share or looking at uh, ways to calculate deal participation in a way that's more tangible than, uh, yeah, I wrote that one up, but we lost it at the competition. Well, why? Were we in front of them at the right time? Was it our product? Was it the way you sold it? Was it the pricing? And so, you know, companies are looking for more intelligence as to yeah. why they're not growing. Yeah. Yeah. You were heavily involved in um, a lot of networking events and, and that type of thing. And mm -hmm. obviously those are, are non-existent yes. today. Have you been doing anything unique, different? Are you involved in anything like that? Uh, sure. Yeah, no, no more free drinks and snacks. Stinks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I certainly miss that part of my job. Um, I am one of those people that uh, goes into a room full of strangers and is excited about it. And you know, some people are just good at that. And others hate it. It's just fun. I mean, I love to I love to meet people and um, I love to learn. Um, and really, you know, I think something as I as I you know, get older and uh, more experienced in my career is that every day I get to work with some really outstanding leaders in and outside of my company. And even just watching the way that they interact, the way that they phrase, um, you know, uh, their messaging, the way that they dictate and drive results in their company just helps me in my professional growth. And you get a lot of that when you're at networking events. Mm -hmm. You can have some, you know, VP, C-level um, person in a really large, you know, $100 million plus organization kind of level with you and give them, give you your, you know, the two cents of you know, what's going on with the yeah. lay of the land in a much <clears throat> more organic and natural way than a video call or an email or a formal sales presentation. Well, I know Concept has hosted mm -hmm. several big networking events, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Here inside your facility as well as outside. And 
what are you doing now and when you can't do that? Are you doing anything like that? Yes. Um, well, you know, I'm involved in a couple industry groups. Um, Mahita is one of them. They have been doing a really great job um, in and pushing um, networking virtually. And so conferences that they had planned to have uh, in person have been switched to remote, of course. Um, and when you go to those events, even though you can't chat and kind of shoot the breeze with people. What you can do is follow up with someone after you both watched the same webinar, or you can, you know, give your, your colleague um, and, you know, your partner a ring and say, hey, what'd you think of that? And not make it a conversation about what we need to do and what we're not doing and all of, you know, all of the day-to-day -day piece of it. So there's still an opportunity to build on those networking events. Um, we've hosted some things uh, at Concept um, that were not necessarily networking in style, um, but uh, more so training and um, providing some e-learning. So right when the pandemic hit, uh, we quickly put together um, a revised version of how we train our sales development reps specific to the industry support that we support. So we had two trainings that we offered um, really to anyone. You could sign up um, and it was a free hour and a half training, two inside of material handling, one in the transportation space, two in the construction so space. So what drove that decision? Why did Concept say, hey, I think we're going to do this? Really, because we heard our customers and we heard our prospects struggling. And there are so much opportunity to be had in, in the markets that we play in that signing on Concept's not going to get everything done for your organization unless you're really trying to put an investment in place and even, yeah. you know, not concept, another third party or even just one person inside of your company. There's not enough how horsepower available to really make that, you know, drastic of an impact. It's got to be a team effort. And so, you know, we thought, hey, we've got 18 years of experience doing this. It's our lifeblood. We do it every day. We've got a, a method that works. Um, we've got a mess method that we can help you personalize. And, you know, it's really just um, something that we were hoping to provide some support yeah. to to our partners and to the, to the um, markets that we play in. It was very well received. Um, you know, I did, I think, four Fridays back, you know, back to back to back, oh, an hour and a half training. Well, you're used to it. You're each traveling Friday. every day, so that's nothing, right? <laughs> Well, they're exhausting for sure, um, but they're also exciting because you know when you get positive feedback you from get many people from those. attend those. Yeah, the first one that we had, which was within material handling space, but specific to forklift dealers and forklift reps, we had over four hundred and eighty people join. Oh, wow! Yeah, and um, to be honest with you, I think that we probably could have put more of a runway in front of it in terms of having people sign up but we wanted to just get it out there fast. We didn't want to wait. And I think a lot of companies right now are also torn in that space where they need to do something immediately, but they want to make sure it's the right way. You know, they want to make sure it's the right message. It's the, the, the right approach. Um, and there's got to be a happy medium in between the two, but we know, we know sales prospecting so well that we felt like we could just put it out there pretty quickly. So we had about 480 people sign up in uh, seven business days prior to the event. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's good. And favorable attendance at the others. We had um, one specific to a uh, construction equipment dealer network that we provide subsidy co-op pro uh, programs for. And so we catered that specifically to their business and some of the promotions that they currently have and just some of the messaging that they're trying to drive through the dealer network at the manufacturing level. And, and we've got a few more of those planned Um it's a it's a refresher for salespeople, and again, it's that skill set that not every salesperson is born with. Yeah. They might be great in person. They might be a great relationship person. They might be awesome at closing, but getting the door to open, if you're not good at it, the juice isn't worth the squeeze yeah. if you're not disciplined at it either. And now they're being asked to do some different things. Yes. Or they're just being forced to do it yeah. because their pipeline dried up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that gives you an opportunity to 
to speak and present. That's, I mean, that's what you like to do. So yeah. that, that kind of gave you. Oh yeah. I, I was really excited about the trainings and I still am. And I think it's, um, you know, uh, in, in the long run might be an additional revenue stream for our organization. Um, and so we're starting to look into, you know, some different ways that we can promote e-learning, not only for our team, but for, for remote teams and, um, you know, there, there's just so much work to be done in the world of sales and marketing. There's so many avenues um, to improve and to promote success. And it's really about a layered approach, a multifaceted approach. What, uh, what are some things in your opinion that are just, they're just downright challenges right now? They're tough. It's just really difficult. You're struggling with it. Concept might be struggling with it. The market's struggling with it. Anything that stands out for you that this is this is tough. Yeah, there's a there's a few things that stand out. I I think if I were to narrow it down to one or two, I would say um, I see a lot of organizations who are struggling with keeping their culture in a in a work from home scenario. I see a lot of organizations that are maybe realizing that. Their culture is shifting. Uh, shifting, yes. That their people's mindsets are shifting. You know, I think a lot of a lot of folks that um, are working from home now are faced with the reality of their families in their space, and that at five o'clock or six o'clock, where you could, you know, decide if you wanted to come home from work or not based on your workload you're already home and you've got to figure out a way to get more efficient, more effective. And maybe that means that there's less time to spend together in brainstorming and creative sessions. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's challenging. There's, there's a lot of sales managers out there who, you know, they used to be able to get their team all in one room and address them all at one time and have that attention and be able to communicate their message in a way that was, impactful, effective, yeah. real. Now they're having to do it via Zoom call or Skype or Teams or just calling people on their cell phone. And everybody knows that in those yeah. scenarios, unless you're dead staring at that person on the other side of the camera, you've got other monitors distracting you, your cell phone, noise downstairs, you know, a knock at the door. And so that attention, I think, is changing the way that, um, you know, companies are um, communicating with one another, but also I just think from a cultural perspective, it's a challenge. You didn't work from home prior to this. No, I, I would, you know, maybe work from home once every couple of weeks when I, you know, needed some time to get my you life together before, yeah. before another trip or something of that so nature. I hadn't done laundry how are you weeks. you adapting to that? You know, I would say that I, I've been on a similar journey. Um, like I said, initially I was, you know, in, I think like everybody just kind of in crisis mode, not even for our own business, um, but myself personally wanting to make sure that myself and my family and my friends were safe. There's all these outside stressors that um, maybe weren't there, just weren't as prevalent, um, you know, in terms of health and safety. And then, you know, of course the, um, uh, you know, injustice inside of the culture that we have in this country, as well as, you know, political pressure. It's, it's, there's a lot to deal with, I think, personally. Yeah. And then when you have a lot of responsibility for your business, you're kind of forced to ignore that. And I think that self-care, you know, everybody loves that term today. That's important, but you know, when you're feeling the pressure and when you feel the pressure that what you do has a huge effect on your organization and potentially the livelihood of other people, you know, people are just, I think, really, yeah. you know, sucked into that. And that can be pretty draining. But um, I'd say, you know, in the last couple months, it's definitely started to feel more positive. And um, I think once the ground, you, you know, stops falling out, underneath you and you start to stabilize again that's the only real time that you can rebuild do you think there's any stabilization going on right now i do yes are your conversations are you when you're talking with customers are you specifically talking about covid or 
COVID is kind of back there. We all get it. We're, we're talking about business now. Yeah. Uh, I'd say the first you know month or so, it was COVID, 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 COVID. I was actually working with a, a partner of ours, just helping come up with some different ideas uh, for an email campaign that he wanted to do. And he said, I don't want to talk about COVID anymore. It's white noise, which is terrifying in itself. But secondly, it, it's a message now that we've all been hearing and there's so yeah. many opinions and we don't know what's real and what's not real. And, and, and you know what? It's a challenge that no one saw coming, similar to uh, an economic downfall without a health crisis on top of it, similar to a natural disaster. It's something that no one can really plan for. And I think every time that something happens like that, a business has to figure out a way to quickly stabilize and say, how do we avoid that happening again? Yeah. So. Well, I think there were a lot of things that people learned. I mean, there were a lot of companies that obviously weren't equipped to work from home, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, so that was a whole technology thing as well as an HR thing. Yes. And then the whole sales force stuff that you just talked about. And so, I mean, companies were turned upside down. Absolutely. But I'm also seeing, just from the people I'm talking to, it's almost like they're getting back to a normal Okay, whatever normal is, mm -hmm. but they are getting back to more of a flat line now. Yes. And they are starting to think out beyond today and tomorrow and they're making plans. And I think that's positive. I do too. And I think that, you know, it, it's a lot more dependent on a territory location too of, of business. And, you know, here in the Ohio area, we've been on a roller coaster, right? Of businesses being shut down completely opening back up slowly, more restrictions coming down. And that all started to happen early on for us. Whereas in, you know, the Carolinas and in, in Texas and California, that might have, you know, happened later or just to a yeah. more um, severe degree. And so I might be talking like, you know, Ohio's starting to pick back up here, but in North Carolina, there's some really large challenges at bay business wise. So, uh, you know, I think I've been trying my best to stay up to date on the latest in, as to what's going on across the country and what's going on within each industry that we support because I can't go to everyone with the super positive hunky dory, let's move on, talk big picture tone when there are still some people that are in that crisis mode. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. And, it's, and I think you said uh, earlier, it's kind of a mixed bag. Some companies have weathered through this very well. Mm -hmm. Some have weathered through it and they got beat up a little bit and some are just trying to get through it at all. Sure. So everyone's kind of at a little different place and, and they arrive at some success at different times and some no, new normals at different times. Mm -hmm. and, but I think the key is you gotta keep moving. You gotta keep moving, right? Especially as a company, if you sit static, you're probably gonna get uh, gobbled up. Yeah, absolutely. Probably gonna get gobbled up. And you're up. probably gonna lose your employees too. Yep. You know, I think people are looking for security and, um, while change is typically something that people are afraid of, when the change is, you know, coming in from a real outside force, not even a company yeah. force, but it, it, like a, you know, the, the country, the yeah. industry. You're forced to deal with it. You have to deal with it. So if you're forced to change and your company's not Ooh. changing, that actually feels, you know, like there's just... Um, no future. Yeah. There's no plan. There's no reevaluation, and it. I think it has made a lot of employees that, that work for companies like that uh, start to look elsewhere for a company that is trying to change, evolve, re yeah. rebuild, maybe, or even just you know grow naturally. How's concept doing through this? We're doing well. Yeah. Yeah. We've had um, in the last several um, months some really wonderful partners join our team. And um, we've also had some partners that, you know, needed to take a, a break um, from the investment or, um, you know, decrease the investment of concept, start to pick that back up. And um, for me, 
Being a partner doesn't mean that we have to do business with you, especially if we've had a relationship or we have open dialogue and there's transparency and there's a genuine quality to our relationship. And so there are still people that, you know, I'm talking with quite regularly that we're not invoicing today, but we hope to invoice in the future. And we also had, you know, long lasting partnership and results where that relationship shouldn't just die immediately. Yeah. So I, I really feel like a lot of, you know, a lot of companies are looking at like what what actually mean what does it actually mean to have a business relationship? Does that transcend spending the same amount of money? Yeah. Or not. Do you think companies are looking more for partners yes, today? I do. Partners taking on a different meaning today, do you think? I do. And I think it's because, one, flexibility, of course, um, and scalability. But two, um, because they didn't have all the answers when, you know, everything fell down potentially or they found some really, you know, um, threatening gaps in their business. And so... They, they're just, they're forced to look elsewhere. So they say, oh, we learned that that, you know, we're not set up to do that. And so we need a partner to come in and either help us get set up or be that, you know, continuity that we need. Sure. Yeah. Well, hey, I appreciate you coming in. It's been good. It's always good talking with you. Likewise. You always have good insight. You have a lot of um, different data points out there. So your insight's always, always interesting and kind of get a little bit of a climate uh uh, barometer from you of what's going out in the market. Well, thank you so much for having me. It, um, it's been nice talking with you too. And uh, I've been listening to the shows and I'm excited to, to see Bifocal doing well. So yeah, uh, I'd love to be a guest again in the future when oh, you'll I'm, have me. I'm sure we'll, we'll bring you back. <laughs> if somebody wants to reach out to you, how, how can they reach you? Sure. Um, you can reach me via email. Um, my email is lzak at conceptltd.com. Um, you can certainly look me up on LinkedIn. I have also become much more active on LinkedIn, putting videos and posts, and I need to continue to up that um, uh, in the coming weeks and months. And then you can also call me directly. My phone number is 330-590-8515. You'd welcome a call. Absolutely. Yep. And I'd welcome a video call too. So you'd welcome somebody to do that to you. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, thanks for thanks for coming back. And I'm sure we'll have you back again. Great. Thank you, Dan. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Uh, Lauren's always, uh, always fun to have on, uh, full of energy, full of insight. And uh, so it's always good to have her on. Um, if you would like to reach her, she gave you her contact information. I would suggest you call her. Maybe you'll get one of those personalized videos back from her. That might be worth uh, just reaching out for, uh, to her just to get one of those. But hey, thanks for tuning in today. If you like shows like this, hit subscribe. We'd like you to follow us and uh, we'd like to see and hear more of you. If you have ideas for shows that you would like us to, to put on, send me an email, dharsh at danharsh.com. Would love to hear from you. Would love to get a show like that on the docket so we can meet your needs. But hey, thanks for tuning in today.